Good morning, I'm Matt Driscoll, editor of Asian Aviation Magazine and AsianAviation.com. Today we are in conversation, we're very lucky to be in conversation with Jennifer Drew Scott, executive chairman of the Commons Project. Jennifer, welcome to In Conversation, thanks for joining me. Matthew, thank you so much for having me, great to be here. I know our time is limited, you're a very busy woman. Tell us about the Commons Project. Uh, I had to do a little research on it when I found out about what we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, a lot of our viewers may not really know what it is and, and also give us an idea of how you got involved. Sure. Uh, the Commons Project is quite new, so I'm not surprised that a lot of people, including yourself, um, still um, learning about this organization. Uh, we started about two years ago. It's basically, um, if you think about how our society is completely so digitalized and this process is only going to accelerate, uh, you know, just look around, you know, go, during COVID, um, everyone's digitalization process is getting even faster. However, when we think about tech and the data, it's uh, still just a few large tech companies or some countries that's tech savvy. So we don't really have any organization that's international, that's not for profit, and um, uh, however, it's tech and data native and be able to build global digital infrastructure as public good. And that's basically the Commons Project. We started by um, you know, creating uh, uh, Apple Health equivalent of you know Android version, uh, you know with Apple support, and uh, it's called Common pa Common Health. This Common Health has already been uh, in you know uh, created and um, you know, uh, sold by on subscription model to companies like Cigna and already in use in the U.S. But of course, this year with COVID, um, our entire thesis in terms of building global. Uh, infrastructure, uh, digital infrastructure needs this kind of governance structure, uh, but also tech native. And um, Common Pass, which I'm sure we will talk a lot more about that, is exactly what we're focusing on since COVID. Um, I know the uh, CEO and uh, uh, co-founder uh, of the Commons Project, uh, Paul Meyer, very well. We're friends for many years. And uh, uh, in the past few years, we've been discussing about how there is a need for digital economy 2.0 and return people's data ownership. And uh, we see eye-to-eye -eye in this, um, uh, you know, in this aspect. And uh, I joined the Commons Project as trustee in the beginning and uh, gradually got roping to uh, the Commons Project more and more. And uh, Paul convinced me to take on the executive chair role. And um, uh, me, based, based on Asia, I have, uh, you know, China background. Um, and Paul, as American, and uh, we have very international coalition in the not only just the team but also our trustees and board members etc exact it is exactly a reflection of what we're trying to build um to serve um you know to provide a solution that's global and that's available for everyone i think this is what the world needs right now the, the reason i got involved and, and it was very interesting to me aviation around the world international flights of course are basically non-existent these days i mean there's a few out there uh, domestic aviation, China's been coming back a little bit to almost to pre-COVID-19 uh, levels. The problem is the quarantines, the border closures, uh, the governments are not, uh, you know, they're afraid of being accused of importing more virus cases and things like that. The common pass uh, has been developed by your group. And basically, and I'm probably oversimplifying this, but basically it's sort of a digital health pass uh, that people can use. You can get on a plane in Singapore, you can fly to London, and it would it would be something that is recognized by authorities at both ends of the equation. Uh, you've had some, a couple of trials, I think, with Cathay Pacific. Uh, they're not doing too good, unfortunately. Uh, and United Airlines, How kind of give us the background of the common pass uh, and how are the trials going, and is is this something that can help solve the problem of international travel? So 
Let's first focus on the problem. Uh, the reality in the world is that you mentioned quarantine, and interest in quarantine is actually a method used in 15th century. And now today we have fast testing, we have all the technology available. The reason why, you know, between uh, countries cannot really open the border safely is because there's no trust between, uh, you know, governments in terms of the departure country's testing result to come to the, you know, uh, uh, destination country. And um, not only that, imagine we live in a world with all these different labs and all these different clinics they're doing tests and uh, if we carry a piece of paper and you know go to border agent uh, agency and you know border agent will have to read that piece of paper and try to tell the difference between different labs different tests are they valid are they genuine uh, without any medical background or training it's just impossible so what we're trying to do is that um, Instead of, um, you know, right now the approach in the world is very much focused on let's open travel bubble, right? And that's useful. That's a really important first step as Hong Kong and Singapore already started. However, COVID is going to be here for a while and we have to figure out a way how to coexist. When you just focus on the bubble, um, there are two ways, you know, between countries you know, travel right now. One is both countries have no or very little cases and then they feel op uh, open uh, to have bilateral travel bubble. Another one is both country have a lot of cases and they just give up and you can travel freely, right? However, neither of this model really can help us to coexist um, with COVID uh, while open up economy. So what Common Pass does is that you are right, it's kind of health pass, but that's only on the surface. What's What we're doing in the back end and the infrastructure we're building um, is really the essence of, of our offer. Um, the most important part is that we basically um, gather, you know, globally this sort of a global white list of um, uh, qualified labs and um, uh, we standardize the testing result in the back end and we give API to those labs and they will be able to test passenger um, you know, before flight, pre-departure test, and then um, uh, the the testing result will be put into our system, Common Pass system, and um, uh, and the front we basically um, simplify that result to a scannable QR code, and that scanning result is binary, is green or red, and uh, because a lot of trust and uh, infrastructure build going on the back end. The border agency and uh, airlines they only need to see imagine the you know airline ground staff right they um they also have to you know um see you know read all this test result so if they can see green or red and they can trust the system and therefore simplify the process so um the goal is that we do pre-departure test and now rapid uh you know um uh uh, a VRC test is actually, you know, takes about 45 minutes for you to get uh, results. So you arrive at the airport a little bit earlier, you do pre-departure test, and your result come out, you're negative, you get on plane, you leave the country, and you arrive at the destination country, and destination country will say, great, you are negative, you are free to go, you don't have to do quarantine. Or they say, you know what, we want to make sure we do double negative, and then you can go, you don't have to do quarantine. And most, you know, those countries, now you have double negative, but just to be sure, we do three days quarantine instead of 14 days quarantine both ways. I think this can significantly um, change, you know, people's, um, uh, you know, in terms of time cost on traveling. And I think this can get our economy going. But of course, this, this requires quite a few very important stakeholders, uh, not only just labs and airlines, airports and the governments, we all have to come together. And this is coming back to my earlier point that the reason this has to be done on not for profit, because if you want to build a global standard, um, you really have to be able to reach every stakeholder they feel comfortable. So this cannot be done by one country or one tech company and it has to be this not-for-profit global framework a big tent everybody can come in yeah let me let me jump in there because that's it goes right into the next question we've, we've had organizations like IATA International Air Transport Association International Civil Aviation Organization ACI world uh, APA here in Asia uh, in, in the manufacturers and the OEMs they're all talking about how safe travel is You've got HEPA filters on airplanes. It's very difficult to get, you know, to become infected on the plane because of the airflow, and et cetera, et cetera. 
and, and they have been working overtime. I can't tell you how many webinars and media conferences I've had to listen to, usually at 10 o'clock at night, my time, when I'm ready to go to bed. But they, you know, they are working extremely hard to convince not just the flying public, but governments and, and the stakeholders that you mentioned. Is there, are you work, is the Commons Project, are you working with them to try to make this sort of a standard feature? Uh, are they listening? Uh, or is it just that the governments are standing in the way? So we're working very closely with IATA, ICAO, and ACI, and uh, um, those bodies are fully on board in terms of what we're building. We're also working with the uh, Star Alliance, One World, and Sky Team in terms of all the front room travelers, you know, with all the member um, flights. Right now we have Pioneer, you know, uh, uh, airlines, as you have mentioned earlier, Cathay is the really the first one who's in this dialogue with us. Um, and United Airlines, we are now uh, talking to Korean Airlines, uh, Singapore Airlines, um, uh, you know, uh, Lufthansa, etc. And um, what's amazing in this process is that you're exactly right. You know, this really needs everybody come you know, uh, on board and have this very harmonized, uh, standardized approach, right? Otherwise, if travelers have to go on board and download, you know, three different apps and or go through three different, you know, system uh, just to get through, you know, a few uh, destinations, it would not work. So um, we have those bodies on work. And what we're doing right now is using our trials, which we have done very well in Hong Kong, Singapore, um, with Cathay Pacific and uh, London to Heathrow with United Airlines, basically just to have all the different scenarios to think through. I'm sure you can imagine how many details we have to think about what if the phone splat? What if you know um, uh, uh, someone you know the uh, couldn't get the, you know Wi-Fi? Or what if they lost their phone? Right. So all the different scenarios. Also, you know, what if their test is positive? You know, do, uh, at which point we need to stop them from going further to the airport? Right. So a lot of those details to think through. So we are right now using those trials um, to work with our partners to learn. And uh, one thing what we are not doing is that to basically create an app and pretend this is just simply you, you put an app in the market and then you know every, everybody just start using it, right? Because we are building upon a very uh, complex and very intricate uh, ecosystem and we want to make sure every step actually makes sense not only just for travelers but also for airports and airlines and therefore we're inviting those partners together working with the labs as well to make this process as smooth as possible for everyone and use those trials as proof of concept and uh, so when we expand you know through one World, Sky Team, uh, um, you know, Star Alliance, and also with uh, IATA, ICAO, ACI, etc. Uh, then, you know, for the rest of the partners to come in, everything makes sense for them. Let me, let me ask you a question, and this just occurred to me. Actually, I mean, who would actually pay for the test? Would it be the passenger? Um, I think you know the assumptions. The passengers are going to pay the test unless some of the governments would like to, you know, subsidize some of the test, um, but. I, you know, it's quite interesting. I was talking to Path Lab uh, in Hong Kong, um, which is quite established a lab um, uh, network in Hong Kong. And um, just like you, because they didn't know what we do. And uh, first question, she said, are you some sort of broker? Because we're inundated by brokers trying to make a profit, um, you know, out of this global crisis. And I said, no, we are, not for profit. Our goal is trying to open the skies as quickly as possible, as safe as possible, while preserving individuals' data. That's our goal. And uh, she said that's really refreshing because, um, you know, in terms of the testing cost will, will become lower and lower. And uh, the labs also, you know, help them to get a large volume and get the economy going. Everybody wins. So um, I think in terms of the cost of uh, um, uh, test will, you know, most likely go to the passengers. But although we don't involve in that pricing, uh, we would like all our partners who sign up this framework really um, have the public good in their uh, mindset and to enable this global economy going first. Okay. Uh, in reading about Common Pass, and, and you just touched on this earlier uh, in, in your response to a couple of questions, 
trust uh, is mentioned prominently. And uh, that seems to be something that's really in short supply these days, uh, whether it's trust in politicians who, and especially, I don't need to mention any names, but, you know, Donald Trump, I'll go ahead and do it. Uh, you know, he is saying, trust me, don't trust the scientists and, and, and all of that. And that's something that uh, without trust in, in these kinds of things, you know, that the, the, the arrival government has to trust that the departing government did its job and that the labs did its job. Uh, how do you deal with either reestablishing or solidifying that trust that people can believe in this system? I mean, that's, to me, that seems very difficult. That's such a, a great and important question, Matthew. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm not here to comment about politics. No, but... no, no. <laughs> but I would say this, you would think when the world facing um, a global pandemic that all the countries will come together and to try to fight this together, right? Um, the reality is not. So um, this is exactly why, you know, if you look at the Commons Project team, we have highly accomplished, highly qualified, you know, very high caliber individuals, um, all very successful from Google to Amazon to you know White House, um, very successful individuals come together and to build this. The reason why we are you know very mission driven, I share this mission, is that precisely because you know at the top of our uh, interview we talk about how the world really missing this kind of tech native. Uh, but not for profit uh, international organization in our world to solve problems like this. So um, we we you know build trust for from a few different uh, levels. One is uh, our fundamental governance structure. We don't have any shareholder um, pressuring us to say, let's make sure we extract every opportunity of profit. Um, you know, when when we have, uh, you know, with this process, I'm sure, you know, any of the large tech companies without naming them, they would love to have this opportunity to build this kind of global network, everybody uploading their health data. But if it was built by Facebook or, you know, Google, the result will be very different, right? We don't have any shareholders say, this is really valuable data, let's collect them, harvest them, and and uh, repurpose and sell them and so we can generate pro profit. Uh, quite the country, we actually keep everyone's PII on everybody's phone um, so it doesn't leave their fo your phone and uh, your most valuable data stay with you. And uh, that's the that's number one most important, you know, uh, fundamental um, uh, measure. Number two is, um, you know, as I already alluded a little bit, is technically how do we solve this, right? Um, obviously, when it comes to trust, especially when you cross border between the governments or so between airlines, um, people are very concerned about what about, you know, your individual users' data? How do you approach this, right? So we use um, uh, a, a, a portfolio of different technologies to make sure that um, the most valuable personal identi identifiable uh, information does not go on going any cloud. And uh, we also keep um, the uh, anonymized information they kept in the cloud in, in Switzerland, but your and the information and data that related to you as individuals stay on your phone. And uh, I don't think any of the uh, commercial established tech company or any startup try to come into this space can say this with, uh, you know, keeping a straight face, right? Because I really think um, end of the day, we live in the world that we have already seen how the last generation of um, uh, digital economy, really, it's all about harvesting every individual's data, repurposing your data, and uh, maximize, you know, um, the the profit from your data um, at expenses of individuals' well-being, uh, uh, young people and older people's um, psychological well-being, the societal's well-being, and you know, to the point even to truth and the, our political system and democracy and the election. So I think it's really important. Uh, this go beyond a little bit on Common Pass, but it's the genesis of why we came together, is to really bring that data ownership back to people. So I think those are very important pillars for us to start to build trust. And truth being told that we've been doing this, you know, for a few months and uh, every day we, uh, you know, wake up. So Paul Meyer, our CEO, 
uh, and I, we, we speak daily and we just so well overwhelmed by the support from everyone because um, everyone started to realize this is the only model that actually makes sense. And the most powerful story I can share with you is that uh, when we work on this, for example, Cathay Pacific, they are calling Singapore Airlines to try to bring them on board and helping you. They're supposed to be competing with each other, right? And we have uh, Amadeus and, uh, uh, you know, Travelport and uh, uh, Sabre, you know, the CEOs came together and say, let's just work together. And uh, then we have, um, you know, uh, Ikeo Ayata and just, you know, bring Star Alliance, uh, One World, Sky Team. They're supposed to compete with each other, but they also come together. And I think that, you know, has already started to prove the power of our governance model and also our approach. So um, from here, we just keep going and keep pushing. And uh, we want to bring this to the world as soon as we can. Well, the, the interesting thing, I mean, you make a great point that, that yeah, uh, Cathay and Singapore Airlines are supposed to be competitors. But what I've noticed, I've been editing the Asian aviation for probably the last five, six years now. And uh, when it comes to safety, uh, when it comes to those kinds of things, people really don't compete. Uh, they work together because it, it's in their best interest, it's in the industry's best interest to work together on things like that. And something like the Common Pass is obviously in the industry's best interest because they're not making money if the planes are sitting on the ground. And so if they can come together and say, hey, this looks good, let's try it, then, you know, you can fly, I can fly, then we can start competing again on who has better first class food and, and all of that, uh, rather than seeing our plane sit on the ground and laying off pilots and cabin crew and everybody else. I know I know you're, you're busy and I don't want to take up too much of your time. I've got a couple of more questions. One may sound a little bit silly. Uh, Colin Pass is dependent on the traveler basically having a smartphone so that they can scan the QR code and all that. What if somebody like my 83-year-old father, uh, who has never sent an email in his entire life, uh, what if he wants to come visit, but he doesn't own a smartphone? How does he, can he participate in the program? Uh, the answer is yes. Before I go to that question, I also just want to quickly comment your, uh, you mentioned that Kathy working with Singapore Airlines. I have to highlight that it's so inspiring to see uh, and Cathay, you know, Mark Hoey, who's the uh, uh, general operation manager and Cathay, he's, uh, you know, one of, he, he is the earliest, you know, partner coming, you know, on board. And uh, he not, he's not only just calling Singapore Airlines, he's, you know, working around the clock, clock or calling his counterparts in BA, in Qantas. And it's really quite inspiring to, inspiring to see, you know, um, this kind of, uh, different partners, different stakeholders are dropping this competitive mentality, but uh, just working together to to open the entire sky. They can have competition later. Um, so to answer your question in terms of, um, uh, you know, what if, what if people don't have smartphone or don't know how to use a smartphone? This is not a silly question at all. We have con considered this. Um, and I will go even a little bit deeper in terms of our consideration. Um, what if it's a single mother um, bringing three children and, uh, you know, two of them are babies and uh, in, the tr in the tram, do they have to download four apps? and the baby have to. So we have to think about all these different scenarios. Um, if you think about the app, the app is just one of the interface. Perhaps it will become the dominant interface with the users uh, just because majority of people do have a smartphone. Um, but for people who don't have a smartphone, also sometimes you lose your smartphone or your smartphone you know, run off the battery then what? So there will be, um, you know, we're working on considering what would be the best way. So uh, a web version, but also the most likely solution is also working, um, you know, with the airlines. So we are able to uh, print this QR code on their boarding pass. So if you have the QR code on the boarding pass and with um, the detail, the binary result, when did you do a test and confirm this, uh, your identity, et cetera, already in the QR code, then, you know, everybody, whoever flies, I will have a boarding pass, right? So, so that's the direction we're looking for. But you're absolutely right. We have to be very inclusive, not only just in terms of partner. We also have to be inclusive with the, the diversity of different type of travelers and appreciate their difficulties. Final question. In, in this, we talk about the value chain uh, of, of aviation, but it's also, I call it sort of the travel chain because you've got the rental car companies, you've got the hotels, you've got... Uh, 
uh, you know, uh, lots of other uh, sort of links in this travel chain. It's not just getting on a plane from here to London. Uh, it's getting in the taxi, uh, going to the hotel. Could something, could Common Pass be used for, you know, things outside of aviation? Could it be sort of adopted wider by the hotel industry and the taxi industry and things like that? I mean, in Singapore, we've got these, you can scan a QR code of the taxi so that you can trace, contact, do contact tracing. Is this something that could be applied to that as well? Absolutely. So first, let's talk about the, uh, again, you know, the problem, the reality, and then our intention and, um, you know, and then come back to reality, right? So right now, of course, when you travel, you're not just taking an airplane and then you land, right? Uh, one key crisis that's happening, and it's not getting enough attention, is that the global shipping industry is really suffering. Why? Because their seafarers, um, and let's be honest, most of the seafarers are from India, Bangladesh, you know, Philippines, etc. So for, for, for them to land on any country right now, it's really hard. So currently, you know, we've been told by BIMCO. So BIMCO represents the ownership of uh, more than half of the world's shipping industry. And um, they start to work with us as well to solve this problem because, you know, there, there are currently about a few hundred thousands of uh, seafarers. Uh, their contracts, ex you know, completely uh, extended. You know, some of them being stranded on on, uh, on the ship for more than a year. And uh, what happened with that is um, the uh, shipping industry supply chain will become a problem, right? And um, um, you know, when the shipping supply chain be become a problem, then you know, right now we're going through a global pandemic. That's the first uh, public health crisis, and we start to see the you know economic crisis. As you already mentioned, you know, Cathay's not doing well. A lot of companies are not doing well. The the third wave could be food security crisis if we're not careful, right? If we disrupt this global supply chain. And also, you know, a lot of people think about vaccine, you know, vaccine will show up, you know, the, 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 the over indexing the arrival of vaccine of the, you know, basically FDA's approval um, as the arrival of vaccine. But my, my sense is that that's only the starting point, right? Uh, the production and distribution going to take a long time. And guess what? Some of the vaccines require extreme low temperature. We're talking about sub zero, you know, minus 70 degree uh, Celsius um, to, you know, during shipping or during transportation. And airplanes not going to be able to do that. Not, there not enough airplane to be able to deliver that, right? So we have to rely on ships. But if all the seafarers continue to be stranded on sea, then, you know, that will be disrupted as well, right? So right now um beyond you know of course all the events um you know once we start using common pass that's not actually easy application right but we want to focus on our effort to not only just connect all the airports but also we connect all the seaports right to get the supply chain going and get those people home um and um um, you know, of course, when we start to connect all this and to using the hotels and, uh, you know, going to events, um, uh, you know, get the event, all the, you know, Tokyo Olympics will need this, right? You know, um, that that's just the natural next step. But I think the more urgent problem is really, you know, get the global airports and the seaports connected. And once we have the global framework, it will be much easier for, um, you know, other applications. And we absolutely have the intention for that. I think, I think your birds are hungry or something in there. I, I, I heard them in there. Jennifer, I know, uh, you know, we could talk uh, all day long about this because it's, to me, it's, it's extremely interesting. And it, it's also, I mean, you know, when I saw, when I was reading about Common Pass, I thought, well, this makes complete, perfect sense. I don't know why this hadn't been done before and everything. Uh, is there anything else that, that you'd like to add very quickly? Well, I think, you know, this takes a, a, a village, and this village is the, our entire global village, right, to, um, you know, to, to work together. And uh, I would just urge um, any of your uh, audience, um, you know, think this can help uh, your community. Um, please, you know, support us, help to spread the word, help to bring, you know, your local governments and different stakeholders to be part of the global uh, common trust framework. Uh, the earlier we can have this, the earlier we can, you know, have our life back to normal. 
Jennifer Drew Scott, Executive Chairman of the Commons Project. Thanks for joining me in conversation. I have to use a little bit of my Cantonese and goisai. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matthew. It's a pleasure.